That sounds a little cheap. C'est la première fois que je commence à bosser sur un sujet et deux mois plus tard je fais une présentation dessus. Ça évite Je vais aussi couper ma caméra parce que je suis pas sûr d'être très bon en termes de débit. Comme je stream en plus. Salut. Alors merci Aidan d'être présent pour que ce soit un événement non franco-français. <rire> <rire> Mais euh, international euh, dans cette ville. Ah, international, on avait déjà, il y avait euh, euh, Renard qui est, qui est marseillais, euh, enfin, qui est français, enfin qui est en France. <rire> et, et, et moi je suis dans le Valais, donc c'est quasiment un autre pays déjà. <rire> Non-continental. <rire> euh, de toute façon, les, je fais en anglais pour euh, les enregistrements aussi. Ouais. Pour... Alors, on parle de ce principe-là. Oh. quand tu veux. Hein. Euh, ouais, vas-y, moi ça me va dès que tu... Enfin, tu veux lancer ou... Alors on est déjà en live. Euh, c est, c est... C est tu veux que je t'introduise ou que tu préfères t'introduire toi-même euh, Indifférent, mais c'est pas peut-être si tu veux faire une phrase d'introduction pour me lancer. Et... Euh, tu peux juste partager tes slides Ok, c'est bon, c'est bon. Ok, so, uh, hello everyone. Today, uh, very uh, happy to uh, welcome uh, Julien Fajot, who's uh, also the main organizer of this uh, event. So, he's finally going to give the speech rather than letting others give the speech. And uh, he's going to talk to us about uh, interesting recent developments into the, the, the algorithms behind the Tunoso platform. Um, Julien, uh, you have the floor. Thanks a lot, uh, Lee. So indeed, uh, my goal is to give uh, an introduction to uh, one aspect uh, that appears to be important in the Tunnel platform, and it's a uh, joint work that we have done recently with uh, with Lee. Um, and the, um, so if I if I try to to motivate, really, we have this situation in Tunnel where uh, we start essentially from uh, personal comparisons that users are. Um, providing uh, on the platform and at the end uh, one goal is to uh, provide global scores for the different contents the different videos that we will call uh, alternative in, alternatives in this uh, presentation um, that you can see here for instance uh, when each video has an attributed score uh, and the big question uh, algorithmically is how to transform the personal comparisons where 
you give personal opinions about like comparing two contents and uh, the global sp score that can be displayed in a way that's uh, uh, fulfilling all the the, the the, the, the criteria that Tunnel wants about security, about robustness, about uh, like uh, being uh, not easy to um, attack or uh, etc. But my my goal personally today is to focus on uh, specific parts of the the Tunnel pipeline. So here is uh, a simplified version of what essentially uh, Tunnel is doing. And uh, so on the left, you start from these uh, comparisons the personal comparisons of the users that I will denote by R. So it's also the occasion to give you uh, notations uh, that will uh, appear. Um, so the first step, I mean, the, the final step, as we said, is to uh, determine the global scores that, that the algorithm is able to uh, give to the content. And for that, uh, essentially, uh, all the pipeline is cut as follow, where um, you first transform the comparison, the personal comparisons into individual scores that are uh, only depending on what the user, what a specific user is uh, comparing. And then the second step behind the, the, the global pipeline is to aggregate these scores uh, using the Behistan algorithm uh, into the global scores. And in the pipeline, you also have uh, the inclusion of the voting rights uh, of the different uh, users in order to uh, testify if we can trust them or not to say it uh, shortly. Um, so, of course, the Tunnel Pipeline can be, I mean, it's a very rough description of it. Um, and today, my main focus will be on the first part of this pipeline, where essentially my goal is to introduce the, the, the theoretical framework that, that we have to completely uh, model this situation in a way that's, I hope, uh, satisfactory, to study really the, the, the going from the comparison to the individual scores. Um, and uh, to explain to you how these parts works uh, before uh, continuing into the pipeline with Mehestan in, in particular. And um, so, but as I said, the, 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 I mean, at the end behind Tournus, there is something more uh, evolved than that. And essentially, this is a more global description of what's going on, uh, where uh, you develop about the different aspects. And just to be clear to, in today's presentation, I will essentially focus on this part here in the more global platform, comparisons into individual scores. Um, so to describe a bit what, what the problem is, uh, it's a situation where uh, you we, we have a lot of contents, uh, and essentially we have alternatives on which we would like to uh, be able to determine what is the quality according to some uh, ideas that we have on, on, on the, what should be a good uh, quality content. Uh, in the situation where the only data available, or I mean, essentially the main data available is when uh, users are comparing between the alternatives. And uh, so this situation, uh, I presented it in the framework of Tunnel, but of course it's um, it's a situation that can happen in many, many situations, in many cases. And for instance, um, one example that can be given is when you are in a competitive sport or for instance something like chess because I, I, I will explain why I, I am focusing on chess besides the fact that I'm personally a chess player but so essentially uh, in situations where you have opponents that are playing against each other uh, you can say uh, these players as actually the alternatives uh, in the sense that each one alternative one content is in that case one player and the comparison between these players uh, for instance in the chess game is just the result of the game and based on these results, so in chess, it's essentially victory, defeat, or draw. Uh, the goal is to provide uh, one way of performing rankings or scores to each player, such that these rankings are reflecting the strength uh, in the in, at, at chess, in this case, uh, between the players. So for instance, here is the current chess ranking in the chess world where it's quantified by this column with this, uh, for instance, uh, world champion or former world champion Magnus Carlsen, which has the highest rating, the highest score in the chess uh, uh, ranking, um, given by, by these numbers, which allow for comparisons. And these numbers are indeed computed from the comparisons. In the case of uh, uh, on uh, the way it's used on YouTube, the alternatives are this time uh, the videos, the comparisons are the data provided by the users, as we said, and of course the scores are the, the final uh, uh, quantified uh, scores that you can find in the recommendations that are given to the user later on. And 
so it's a similar situation in the sense that it's the same problem of transforming the comparison into uh, transforming comparisons into scores, except and this this is the specificity that motivated this work um, that we have done. That in Tournesol we are in the situation when the comparison can take uh, different values between two extremes. Essentially, let's call them minus one and one to give a like most subtle uh, comparisons. That's just saying this one is better or the other one is better. And so taking into account this uh, more uh, precise uh, comparisons was uh, the motivation for uh, really um, studying more carefully what kind of methods can be used. Um, so just for the notation that I will uh, use all along uh, in, the, in, in the presentation, I will essentially use these colors where uh, all the time I will talk about alternatives that will be in uh, orange which goes also with the scores associated to the alternatives. So the scores uh, will be denoted with uh, theta, while the comparisons will be with uh, R uh, for the result of the comparison between, between the, the, the two alternatives. So essentially, you can interpret R as uh, indexed with A and B, where there are alternatives, saying, telling you how much better is A compared to B with the, the convention in this case that uh, if the comparison is one, uh, means that I prefer A. Uh, I may have not exactly the same convention as what you can find in some uh, Tunisol papers, uh, but uh, this I, I let you tell me uh, Lee, if, uh, if I'm wrong. But OK, it's just a convention anyway. So the higher R I A B, the better I think A is compared to B, while in the scores scales, uh, it's the idea that you associate to each content this time, not a comparison, a value. And the higher this value is, the better you believe that the, the content is on the score scale. So different notions. And the big question, how do you go from comparison to scores? So I mean, the, the, the way I will uh, uh, talk about uh, the, the, the results that we had and, and presenting all this is to start by the initial idea that uh, you have a historical model, which is well known uh, by the community of people uh, aware of this uh, transformation of paired comparisons into scores, which is called the Bradlett theory model, which has been introduced in the 50s, um, where essentially we are in this situation where we can just have the results of like uh, victory of defeat, which takes values one or minus one between uh, alternatives. But uh, the generalization that we will introduce is, uh, again, as, as I already a bit presented with the, for the needs for Tonosol, about like the, the so-called generalized Bradley theory, where the comparisons can possibly take other uh, values. For instance, it can be the continuum between minus one and one, which is the main case we're interested in. It could be also like any real value. And in some sense, implicitly, we, we have the notion of a domain of values on which the, the comparison is restricted. And we see that in that case, uh, we call it generalized Bradley theory because we recover the Bradley theory model by uh, restricting really the values to only uh, binary uh, values. And then, um, so essentially, a slight adaptation of the model, which is uh, like uh, adding some prior on the score, will, uh, I, I will explicit this later, but will essentially provide the Bayesian version of it, which is. Um, which appears to be uh, to have good properties uh, later on. And so uh, what will come next is really like using this first framework with these different models to, um, I mean, as models to reconnect scores and comparisons to then uh, sort of inverse the problem. Like uh, before, we were essentially saying, OK, if I have some scores here as the way the, the comparison will work, that would be the first part. But then you can invert it and explain how you can use this model that we provided to transform now the comparisons into the scores, essentially by uh, formulating the problem as, as a statistical optimization problem with some likelihood based on the previous model. So that's where I will introduce the, the, the estimators that we propose for the, the, the score uh, estimation based on this framework. And uh, essentially, the, 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 the talk will end on like the study of the properties, the first properties that we identified to this operator, to these estimators, sorry, because we, um, I mean, we will reveal that they are essentially, they are behaving well for the task they are uh, made for two reasons. The first one is the monotonicity, which essentially implies that, I mean, 
when a user is, is uh, giving a comparison, he always has interest to uh, provide the better comparison for the content he prefers. Uh, and this will not degrade the score. So it's really a minimal a desirable prop uh, property, but which is actually non-trivial. And the second is about um, a notion of uh, resilience in the sense that we don't want modifications of the comparisons of a given user to affect too uh, strongly uh, the scores of this user, because uh, this is an important first step for the, secu the global security of the, the Tunnel pipeline. So I hope uh, the, the global roadmap is, is clear and we can now uh, go to the, the, the Bradley theory model. And um, I mean, one thing I didn't say is that, uh, I mean, the, the, the key first idea is to um, model this situation that we implicitly understand that there are strong uh, connections between scores and comparisons using a random model. So the main idea is that uh, the result of a comparison is maybe not uh, like a clear uh, understanding that um, the, the, con the, the alternative A was better than B, but it's more this idea that on average, I mean, think about chess players or football teams playing against each other. It's not always the, 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 the better which is winning, but it's in average the better which is winning, which is some sort of a way of understanding what's the level of, uh, of, of a team or of a player. Here we are in the same situation where uh, we, we, we make the strong assumption that the alternatives that we are comparing are all um, uh, associated with a hidden score, theta A, and uh, that this score is able to uh, give a statistical prediction of what should be the result of the comparison between uh, A and B when we know the scores of A and B. So um, this means that from scores, we are sort of able to understand what should be a reasonable comparison. But the result of this comparison has this random aspect that it's not fully determined because, uh, I don't know, for instance, in Tunnel, the user can have a uh, different mood according to when he is uh, or she is um, uh, addressing the comparison or, or all the situations that could make this value to be noisy in some sense. This is to encounter this situation. So here, the, the, the comparison are denoted by uh, matrix R. But what's important is that this matrix is, uh, so you see here, it's anti-symmetric in the sense that essentially uh, make the assumption that comparing A and B is the same as comparing B and A, except we've just changed the, the sign of the comparison, which is all, all, always uh, supposed to be symmetric, like the, 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 the possible values of R. So when we have 0, for instance, it means that we appreciate I mean, uh, we, we, we have no preference between the two, but we distinguish between having no preference, which is an expressed preference, and for some pair, some for instance here with the contents A and, B, uh, A and C, sorry, I put a small star to reveal that we don't have uh, all the comparisons, like the user can provide a sparse, uh, part, uh, sparse sub matrix of the complete matrix of the contents he, have, he, he or she has uh, watched. So, um, this is why I need this uh, important notation for me to, uh, to to denote by big C. Sorry, just remember this as the comparison that has that have been indeed compared. Uh, in in the case of the, the the matrix R that you see on the left, uh, we see that, for instance, contents A and C are not uh, part of the set C of the compared uh, alternatives. So as I said, uh, implicitly, there's this, this idea that, I mean, in some sense, going from a score to a comparison is something which is conceptually more simple, because you can use the difference of the scores as a way of saying which one is better, and also as a way of quantifying how much better you are. So if I give you the scores, then taking the difference, what is denoted by theta, theta uh, AB now, is um, is one way of saying uh, what's, what's the result of the comparison that we should have. And um, the, the so yeah sorry and uh, when I say approximately equal it for this idea that it it seems to be a reasonable value if the scores are correct to uh, determine what is the result of the comparison and the big problem is how to do the converse part and so for that we make the the following assumptions on the random model on uh, the comparisons um, uh, with respect to the scores we assume that 
the comparison between A and B, given the scores. So first of all, first equality, it depends only on the difference between the, the scores of A and B. So it's not dependent, for instance, of the scores of the other content. And so this is the first assumption, which is uh, essentially saying all the relevant information is only on the scores of A and B. And the second hypothesis, which is uh, uh, the second equal equality, is to assume that actually this probability is given and in the, um, in the right, the, the, the important part to start with is the exponential. So it's this, this term with exponential of R A B times the, the difference between theta A and theta B. If you want, like we assume that this is the way uh, the two uh, numbers like R A B and theta A minus theta B are uh, coupled in the probability low behind. So you can take this as a, um, a priori formula that's not um, that, that I will not for which I will not give a clear justification. But what we will see a, a posteriori, uh, I will focus on that more in this presentation, is why um, this um, the, 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 this model and with this assumption of an exponential of this form is actually relevant for what we aim at doing and uh, also provide algorithms with the nice properties that I already mentioned in the roadmap. Uh, so this is uh, the model for single comparisons, and now I should tell you how the comparisons uh, are, com are uh, behaving uh, between uh, each other. And the second assumption that we make is that the comparisons are independent from each other conditionally to the score. So this means that if I take two different comparisons, if I know the scores, I assume that the the the, the the source of randomness, knowing the score, is essentially uh, some, some kind of a, a noise which uh, is independent on each comparison. So in some sense, it's really a strong assumption that the score is uh, reflecting all the statistical information up to an uh, unremovable uh, randomness, if you want. So this independent assumption can be translated mathematically into the fact that the, the probability law in the random model of the complete uh, comparison um, matrix with respect to the score is a product between all the other comparisons. And with that, we have this idea that all the products will always be on the compared pair. So that's why I highlight uh, that AB here is in C. Remember that we will always see this formula all along. It's this idea of independence plus uh, reminding that C is what we indeed have compared. So this is the random model uh, implicitly, and that's an interpretation that's uh, not so classical of uh, this uh, historical uh, model that I mentioned, the Bradley theory model, where uh, if you remember the comparisons in this case were restricted to only two values, so binary comparisons. And in this model, what is usually assumed is that the link between the, the comparison and the, the score is given by this formula. So we use the scores theta a in this case as follow, like uh, you have this uh, sort of definition of the model where the probability is uh, defined that way. And um, so if I uh, reinterpret this model, what I'm saying is giving a probability law over uh, random variable r, a, b, which can take only two values. And what the model specifies is the probability to have one, and therefore the probability to have minus one is one minus the probability to have one. So in some sense, what the model says is that it, it, it models this dependency as a uh, Bernoulli uh, random variable with the uh, with probability of occurrence is parameterized by uh, theta in the way uh, presented here. So we can see that it's doing something uh, relatively reasonable because, um, I mean, at least at first sight, because if we uh, take the case where all the scores are equal, then uh, we end up with a probability which is one half. This reflects that with equal scores, I have uh, the same uh, probability to see A uh, winning or B, B winning. While if we start having an increasing uh, difference of the scores between A and B, we end up with having a probability one, which reflects that uh, if the level of A is increasingly uh, and, and is uh, infinitely better in some sense than the, the, the level of B, the score of B, then we know that the comparison will be for, for sure that the, the, the A is winning. So, uh, 
I mean, this is the probability for a, R, uh, AB equals one, but in general, for the two values, one and minus one, we can uh, formulate directly this formula, which is essentially uh, the same, uh, replacing R by one, you see that you recover the same, but R can also be uh, minus one. So we see that there is this uh, nice uh, formula. And in this framework, in this historical model, um, we uh, end up with uh, this idea, if I reuse the formalism that I've been uh, presented before, that the global law is given by this product uh, using the independence. We also are interested in the likelihood of um, this probability. And using the likelihood, we can invert the problem of saying, OK, knowing the comparison R, what is the, the, the score, which is the, explaining the best the comparisons that we have observed. So formulated that way, it's a so-called maximum likelihood estimator when we uh, determine theta star as the theta that minimizes the uh, negative log likelihood or equivalently that maximizes the probability of observing R given theta. The, the, the best theta is considered as the one that is the most uh, likely to explain what we have observed. So I hope the, this first uh, model is clear and, and do not hesitate to ask because essentially uh, that's one way of presenting it, which is, um, uh, uh, I would say, not the not classical, but equivalent to the ones that, uh, that are usual. But essentially, the generalization that we would see is exactly redoing uh, the same, except that we change the starting point and we don't consider binary comparisons. So more precisely, imagine that now we have comparisons. Oh, sorry, that yeah. Chia, yeah. I have a quick question. Can you go back to the previous slide? Um, yeah. What do you mean by um, this is like a kind of a reinterpretation of, of Bradley theory, or it's like it's not the standard way of presenting it? Uh, what I mean, I, usually in what, uh, okay, maybe this you can correct, but the, the way for me uh, I see Bradley theory is um, presented, we, I mean, usually it's, um, more presented as like the probability of R being equal to one is equal to, let's say alpha divided by alpha plus beta. And uh, I would say it's just for me, I don't see this presentation of, how can I say that? Um, I mean, it's not always presented as a, a conditional law for me. That, that, that's, uh, that's one way of describing it, which is, uh, for instance, this formula that P of R given theta is given by that. Um, is not uh, a definition for me. It's a consequence of the the the, 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 the usual uh, formalism. But I don't know if you uh, would agree uh, with that. So okay, I see. So, but I, I okay, I'm not sure what you mean because the I do think like if, if you look at the original old paper, the, the one from 1952, mm -hmm. I think from the very beginning it was conceived. The, the model was conceived of, of as um, you have parameters underlying the the uh, probability of uh, plus one and minus one. And so I think it was from the beginning conceived of as you're specifying a conditional distribution of mm -hmm. uh, like the outcome of a comparison based on some underlying parameters. And, and then you can also write the likelihood function and like already in the original paper, they were like, okay, can we recover the parameters by doing maximum likelihood estimation? Now, I, I agree that the one thing that's different here in, in your presentation compared to the original model is the it's true that in the original model, it was not this exponential parameterization. So it was, as you said, alpha divided by alpha plus beta. But, yeah. um, but I think the idea of like a, having a conditional distribution for the outcomes and then trying to infer the parameters with maximum likelihood was already there from the beginning. So like this is this uh, the only thing that's different here, I would argue, is the, the change of parameterization. Like, OK, you're right. It's, it's, um, it's an interesting. Uh... Uh, it's an important point that at the end it's really a uh, sort of a reformulation. Um, it's just, yeah, I, actually, uh, maybe I could have it stayed that way. So I agree that the change of parameterization is, is uh, kind of important and useful because it's uh, instead of having to think about ratios of the parameters as the, the quantification of how much favor is an alternative compared to the other, now it's it's in additive scale. I mean, that, that's the advantage of. Uh, using yeah. the exponential function, you, you, you transform a multiplicative scale into an additive one. And I think it's mm -hmm. much more enjoyable to work with. Um, and, and it also has non trivial consequences in terms of, uh, um, yeah, never mind. Yeah, I, I agree. So it's a useful reparameterization. But 
Yeah, and actually, maybe I, I could uh, give also some uh, historical context about this parametrization because at the end, uh, Bradley theory was not like that, but the Bradley theory model is maybe less known that the, than the, the LO rating, uh, which was the one used in the chess community, as I mentioned before. And you can find LO ratings, which are transforming comparisons into scores in many uh, sports, actually, if you try to like LO rating of almost any sport, you can see how the, the players are compared. For instance, you can do, do this as tennis, uh, for tennis. And um, what I checked uh, yesterday, actually, but uh, the LO rating is using this parametrization uh, with this exponential. But at the end, it's very, very similar to um, Bradley theory in the initial uh, formulation. It's just like uh, it's another way of, I mean, it's another problem which is solving at the end. But uh, we are we are sort of mixing these two uh, very famous uh, uh, models, Bradley theory and LO rating, which are known to be uh, very close. Anyway. I have a question. Um, yeah. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Um, well, I, well, I guess I, I see how, but like it's not clear from your presentation that uh, the Bradley model is an instance of a it's particular like your. your formula yeah. Okay. So, um, like if you just look at this formula with the exponential of R uh, A B, uh, it's indeed true that. Uh, if I show this formula, it's not obvious. Um, how can I say? Uh, but in some sense, this formula is really like, um, OK, look at the formula on the right. So uh, am I correct? This is your question. Like, is, why, why this is uh, why, why this is covered by, by Yeah, yeah, you just, yeah, like the exponential uh, R theta is yeah. three. So three I, I, I would come back. At some point, to give a more precise formula how it fits the generalized model. But in this case, okay, if you look at this formula here, if you multiply uh, on the denominator and numerator by uh, exponential of r theta a b divided by two, you 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 can have like the dependency on r that only appearing in the uh, numerator because the the what happens on the denominator is something that that is just the, the sum of the two exponential. It's a cosine of theta AB, and there is no more R. So, OK, sorry, it's a bit technical as a way of saying it, but it's easy to play with this formula, such that you can put it in the form of the previous one. And um, I, I will reveal it a bit differently uh, later. Good. But actually, it's a, your question is also showing that the, the generalization that we propose is not uh, exactly clear uh, in the sense that uh, it will be clearer in the next slide. But when you start with a general comparison and you want to generalize this model, what we are essentially doing is that um, the generalization consists in providing this probability law of R given theta, so R A B given theta A B, so uh, for alternatives A and B fixed. And essentially, the assumption that we make related to this random model that we have is with this term of exponential theta R, as I said. And one way of describing this probability law, which is uh, classical, is to express what happens by identifying also the law of the comparisons when the scores are uh, uh, equal. So it's when theta AB equals to zero. So essentially, this is saying, OK, what's the randomness uh, of the comparison when we consider that the, the two contents are of equal quality? And by making this assumption, um, so we, 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 when I, I write this proportionality factor, what I mean is that essentially, okay, I know what is the law of R is transformed by this transformation. And uh, because the quantity on the right is not anymore a probability law, that's the, the, the equality below, uh, then in order to transform it as a probability law, I need to uh, divide by in the integral of what's uh, up. And so we are sure that under this, uh, under this model, what we describe here mathematically is indeed a probability law. And we see that having this assumption of uh, connecting R and theta with this exponential has the effect on the probability law to put theta, OK, that way in the numerator and in a more complicated way in the, in the denominator. And what, hap what appears in the denominator is really the crucial quantity to understand to, um, to, to see why the, the, the model can be generalized. So here, when I note with a pink P um, 
for the, the probability law of R given zero, it's a notation that we will fix all along and we will track uh, with this color P uh, how does uh, this assumption on the probability law with uh, equal scores uh, is reflected um, on the model. So this integral that you can see uh, in the denominator is the, can be, I mean, essentially you see that it's a moment associated with the probability law uh, P uh, pink. Moment, an exponential moment in the sense that it's essentially the average over this probability law of exponential theta r, where r is the, the raw number quantity. So this, this, can, this is also known as the moment generating function. And we will see that the logarithm of this quantity, which is known as the cumulant generating function, because it's, it's a, a function which gives the, the cumulants of the probability law p, we will see that this quantity is actually playing a big role uh, in all the, 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 the framework that we will introduce. More precisely, uh, I mean, the, 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 there are two reasons for that. First of all, uh, this function phi, so defined that way, is uh, known to be strictly convex, and uh, which means essentially that also the, its derivative is an increasing bijection between, so it's a, it's a function that takes theta uh, in, uh, as an input, uh, the log of the integral of the output, and uh, we can show also that the, 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 the derivative of this function has essentially the, 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 the good property to go from the domain of theta, which is in this case uh, assumed to be r, into the domain of the comparisons um, uh, uh, which is essentially uh, most of the time will be for us uh, minus one one. Um, so remember that this function here uh, will be crucial because essentially the, the, the main reason is as follow. If we go back to the model of like, okay, probability of R given theta, the maximum likelihood estimator that we defined is, okay, minus log of the, 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 pro the conditional probability. And if you reuse uh, the, 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 the phi function that we have, you end up with a, uh, an optimization problem where you have this time to minimize this quantity where you sum over all the comparisons that we have done. And we see that the parameter R is uh, uh, playing a role in the in the in the minimization problem by just appearing as minus r theta a b, and uh, this function phi appears to be uh, the, the in front of theta a b also. So you you end up with this optimization problem, and since we know that the, the the function phi is strictly convex, we end up with an optimization problem that we know uh, is strictly convex. This being true for any uh, initial probability law that you put on the score. So one way of looking at this model is really saying, if I fix this probability law, so denoted by uh, pink P, this specifies fully the model according to the assumptions that we have made and the generalized bradley theory uh, maximum likelihood estimator is given as the minimization of uh, uh, strictly convex um, optimization cost, uh, which is the the the, the, the like, which is related to the likelihood of the of the model. So this is the the generalized framework, and uh, related to your uh, question, Lee, uh, actually the the so remember it's really about like going. I mean, we have this function phi that I recall the, the definition. If we revisit the Bradley theory model, we have a binary comparison, and in this in this case, this can be interpreted as um, saying that the 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 the, the, the p law of before is uh, sum of two Dirac functions, so it's it's one complicated way of talking about the Bernoulli random variable, because in the case of binary comparisons, when the scores are equal, as we said before, we have equal chances of having a or b uh, being preferred. In this case, if you look at what is p and uh, what is the definition of phi, you easily see that you can compute the phi function. So phi of theta is equal to uh, this quantity in this case. And uh, it's interesting. <laughs> okay. It's interesting to uh, realize that at the end, uh, the, the phi function has a simple expression and also to wonder, okay, because we took this more abstract perspective than Bradley theory, taking a general P, what can happen if we change P's to take things that we, we prefer? And typically that was the initial idea of Lay. That's why I, I propose to call this uh, model 
the uniform Bradley theory with uh, uh, reference to uh, the, the, the person who decided uh, to, to study it in the beginning. Thank you, Leigh. Uh, so this situation is when we end up with continuous comparisons between minus one and one. So if we do that and we assume that, let's say we have no assumptions on the scores in the sense that we, we put a uniform law on the comparisons when the scores are all equal with this assumption, it provides a model. It provides a model for which uh, we can uh, easily compute the function phi of theta. It's simply uh, in the definition uh, replacing the integral by an integral of minus one one, injecting the uniform law. And by doing so, we have a very similar uh, formulation with a very similar problem. You see that you just replace the cosine, the hyperbolic cosine appearing here with some uh, hyperbolic sinus divided by theta. And by this simple change, uh, the, the, the true uh, modification of the method is important because it allows you to shift from a, a one method that's been tailored for just binary comparisons into continuous domain comparisons. And so the generalized uh, model can be specified with other kind of uh, examples. But uh, you can keep these two examples in mind, uh, the historical one and the one which is the, the, the first idea that you can uh, propose for uh, bounded comparisons between minus one and one with uh, as simple as possible uh, assumption, initial assumption uh, on, the, on the comparison on the score if you take the uniform law. Yeah, I'm not sure the reviewers will enjoy the name of the model you propose. Um, we can always say it's a typo. So it's a... <laughs> but do you like it? That's the real question. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so um, it's it's an uh, instantiation of the, the this generalized Bradley theory, and um, maybe to understand a bit better what's going on, what I propose is that we focus on a, a toy problem, which is what happens when you are in a situation, single user, only two contents, two alternatives, and the user provides one comparison between these two alternatives. And the big question is, how do we transform this comparison into uh, Okay, in this case, the difference of scores between A and B. So R, A, B is given. Let's denote it by small r because there are no, no other uh, case. And, um, and uh, theta A, B is estimated in this case. So in this situation, essentially, uh, if you look at your optimization problem, it's a 1D problem, a uh, simple one, and we are minimizing phi of theta minus R theta. So if you take the derivative with respect to R, you end up with uh, this equation solved by theta star of R, which is the only point, unique point uh, which the, for which the derivative is zero. So remember that phi prime was a function which is essentially a continuous bijection. So in some sense, we understand what the, the method is proposing. It's transforming R into the inverse function of the derivative of phi to provide a score theta. On the plot, this is what's happening. Essentially, here, imagine you're in a situation where R is uh, constrained to be between minus 1 and 1, for instance, with the uniform Bradley theory model. The value of R, uh, AB, is known. The, the, the shape of the function phi prime is typically a shape which is given uh, by this. And you, you can uh, look at how they look for different uh, models. And actually, they all have these kind of shapes when it's between minus 1 and 1. And um, it's, uh, it's the form of what, what is often called a sigmoid function. And so this is extremely classical to have uh, the connection between R and theta, which is essentially, you look at R, you look at the sigmoid function, and you find the theta, which is uh, corresponding. So imagine, for instance, that R is going, R A B is going to 1. You see that theta uh, is following the asymptote, uh, is theta going to infinity uh, with R equals 1. Um, which is uh, exactly what we we can expect uh, with uh, a scale of scores uh, on, on, over all the, the reals. And uh, what it says also is that it gives a very important interpretation on the function phi prime, because it says essentially that's the function which is able to convert uh, comparisons into scores. When you apply its inverse function to R, you transform R into a score theta. And that's something that's reflected in all generality on the model. If you look at what is the expected value of a comparison 
conditionally to the scores, you recover the same idea that it's actually given this expected value for the random model is given by phi prime of uh, the difference of thetas. Uh, so in some sense, you have, I mean, in the model, what's happening is that R A B is fluctuating around its, uh, its, its value phi prime of theta A B. And uh, an interesting fact also uh, classical for this kind of settings is that the variance of the same quantity conditionally to the scores is this time given by the second derivative of phi. So this is also one reason why the, the, the function phi is uh, especially interesting is because uh, you, we see that it appears with uh, nice interpretations on the stochastic model uh, via uh, the functions phi prime and phi uh, second. So these two contents and one comparison setting, I hope helps uh, understanding what's going on between one given comparison and the scores of two contents. And uh, now uh, the, 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 the last adaptation of the model is uh, about this so-called uh, Bayesian generalized proletary model, where we uh, change slightly the perspective because before we treated theta as a parameter, now we will put a prior law on theta, and essentially I will only treat the case where we assume that uh, scores are a priori uh, uh, fulfilling an IID Gaussian law. Um, the, 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 so we will see that this has uh, several advantages, but in particular, uh, the big difference is that uh, we will change the, the sort of statistical paradigm on which we will do the, the estimation. Because before we were uh, essentially using theta as a parameter using a maximum likelihood estimation. This time, using the Bayes law, you can express the probability of theta given r. So it's more like uh, now you, you work conditionally to the observation you have uh, observed, and you try to determine um, the, the 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 best theta based on this time the conditional probability of theta given r. And by replacing this, uh, you end up changing your cost functional this time taking the minus uh, log likelihood, the negative log likelihood, based on the posterior law of uh, the, the scores with respect to the comparison. So this probability of theta given R. So very similar, and you can play the same game and uh, wonder if you uh, wonder what is the, 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 the what, what do you end up with as an estimator, this time called the maximum a posteriori, because it's the one which maximizes the, the a posteriori uh, low of the of the scores, and you see that it's very uh, similar to the previous optimization problem at the end. And the effect of having had uh, this um, prior law on the scores, from the perspective of the optimization problem, it's um, it has an effect of uh, it has a so-called regularization effect in the sense that it adds some regularization on the scores theta, on, in the form of this uh, norm of theta square, which is known to uh, yeah, regularizing in this case means I mean, can be interpreting, interpreted as a smoothing also. Uh, and we see important that the parameter alpha will, in this case, cap capture that. That's why I choose this uh, unusual parametrization on the Gaussian before, can capture the, 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 the impact of this regularization. Alpha going to zero corresponding to the previous case, while uh, you can increase alpha and uh, have a regularization, which is more and more important until uh, taking uh, all the, 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 the relevance on the class function. So remember that for each phi and each alpha, this gives us an estimator. And it's a big question to be able to identify a useful alpha. That, that, that's not exactly what I want to detail here. The advantage also of adding a regularization is that it transforms the problem into a strongly convex optimization problem. And the strong convexity comes from the regularization. And uh, this is uh, th therefore something that can be solved. And interestingly, this means that uh, we end up with strongly con convex problems for which we, we have general solvers. Uh, whatever is the uh, initial assumption we put on the comparisons uh, for uh, zero scores. So essentially, as soon as you have a model, this gives you a function phi, this gives you an estimator, and this gives you a strongly complex problem that can be solved. So that's what we, we, we hope we can uh, play with on the tunnel pipeline. And so if I just try to understand what's happening when I, I do this uh, Bayesian modification, uh, we see that uh, in the case of two contents and only one comparison, this is uh, again a 1D problem. And this time, the, the solution of this problem is almost the same, except that the addition of the regularization has this effect of uh, adding a, a linear term. So if I come back to the, the previous uh, interpretation I gave, 
So the pink one is the previous curve that you have seen when there is no regularization. And now with the green uh, curve, you see that essentially this alpha uh, theta over two is adding uh, a slope to the, to, the, to the quantity. And so we see that essentially um, we, I mean, it has the effect first of going, uh, like of having a, a, the, the green function, which is um, not restricted to uh, minus one, one anymore. And uh, this will affect, of course, the value with the tendency of pushing values towards zero when alpha is augmented. That's what you can see here, comparing the theta star uh, when there is no alpha with a uh, positive value of alpha, which is essentially closer to zero. So again, very simple interpretation of what's going on and the effect of the regularization can be uh, seen from this, uh, from this uh, toy problem, toy, toy example, if you want. So uh, to wrap up uh, the, the, the model that has been presented, this so-called Bayesian generalized broad model, we uh, have these assumptions that uh, can be uh, uh, summarized into these formulas where uh, we know that the, the, the model is essentially specified fully by uh, the low p of the, um, the scores uh, with respect to, uh, sorry, of the comparisons with respect to null scores. Uh, this uh, integral that's specifying the, the phi function is important. The alpha is an additional parameter. You have this map estimator, which has nice property, uniqueness of the solution because of strong convexity. And, uh, and, and uh, so a tool that can be used for very various uh, probability law on R uh, a priori, uh, later on. Um, now I will present the two properties that uh, could be uh, shown on these estimators. So the one that I just uh, summarized before and uh, try to give you an idea of what are desirable properties. So essentially imagine that you have, uh, so the user has the choice between these two comparisons. So on the, on the left, the comparison R, where you see that you have some values that are given, some others that are uh, not, that's the stars when the, the comparison is not provided. And what I will uh, present as a monotonicity of score estimators is essentially the situation as a user when uh, you know you are comparing two contents. And what you want to be sure is that uh, when you, the, the fact of increasing one of the comparison towards A more than B will have the effect of increase the score of A. Um, actually, that's, uh, that, that, that's, that's sort of obvious that's something that you want for a scoring method, but it's not so obvious to achieve. And typically, uh, you have versions of the Tunnel pipeline for which, uh, for extreme scores, uh, for extreme comparisons close to minus one and one, sometimes this property has been observed to be uh, not uh, true uh, by the users. And this affects clearly the way they behave on the platform by avoiding, for instance, to put uh, like, uh, comparisons close uh, equal to uh, the highest values. So that's something that uh, we want to avoid. So to formalize this notion, um, this is what uh, we propose. Essentially, we say uh, that uh, two comparisons for a given alternative A are, uh, I mean, one comparison is smaller than the other one. If uh, R prime is a modification of R where essentially we maintain all the comparisons that are not related to R, so we keep the same value RBC, uh, but we change possibly all the values uh, that are uh, about the content, uh, the alternative A, by taking better values. So this means essentially we reevaluate all the judgments that we have in favor of A. And so in this situation, that's where we uh, end up hoping that uh, good uh, uh, scoring methods from comparisons is able to transfer this property of like clearly R prime is such that we prefer A uh, more than in the scenario with R is reflected by uh, an increasing of the scores. Um, that's what we define as a property of monotonicity. And uh, which captures what we what we hope. And what happens is that we have this result that the, 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 the map estimator, the generalized proletary map estimator, is always increasing in this sense. So we know theoretically it's funded that the, the whatever you use as a prior law uh, on the comparison for zero scores, this will always be true, whatever is alpha and whatever is the, the, the law. So it works for all the models. 
this is a nice property which is strongly pushing towards the fact of using it especially it's uh, uh, it can be used, for instance, for uniform comparisons or all the other models that you can uh, you can hope for. Um, and uh, actually, that's uh, just for the story. It's the initial question that they asked me to to see if like we, we this was formulated as a conjecture, and um, it's uh, it was the the, the the main guess that that uh, that they had that this should be true uh, in this context. Um, the second property, the second desirable property is about what uh, I call resilience uh, or could be called uh, Lipschitz resilience also. Um, the, um, so this is also a notion of what happens when we change the, 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 the comparison matrix, but in a different way. Essentially, what I want to introduce now is what, what can be called like an elementary modification of the matrix, uh, of the comparison matrix. It's when you change only uh, one entry of the matrix, actually two because of the anti-symmetry, but one uh, in terms of degrees of freedom. And we can distinguish between two situations, one where we have already compared, uh, for instance, in this case, um, uh, B and, okay, you see it's B and C, it should be B and D. Imagine that B and D has been compared and we decide to change to reevaluate, the user decides to reevaluate what, uh, what the result of the comparison, because for instance, uh, uh, he changed his mind or something like that. And, uh, or in a situation where it's adding, the, the user is adding a new comparison, for instance, in this case, uh, RAC. So it's ever new or uh, change of comparison. Uh, in this context, we will define the notion of resilience when the score cannot be affected too much by such an elementary modification. Uh, what we mean by that is the existence of a beta, and we call it it's being beta resilient if the, the L2 norm of the theta hat is, um, or the difference of the L2 norms of the scores between R and its modified version with an elementary modification is bounded. And asking for that uh, make us uh, sure that we can control the effect of single decisions of the users, therefore of the decisions of the users for the comparisons into his or her global score, uh, her uh, personal scores, and this is preparatory to understanding more globally the complete pipeline of Tunsol when uh, we have this uh, much more challenging uh, aspect for the for the for, for this kind of uh, resilience issues to aggregate scores um, into like the global scores. So uh, the the situation that's happening in this case is that we also end up with a nice theorem, which is essentially saying uh, that things are uh, going well. If you make the, the assumption that the, the, the comparisons are bounded, so for instance, let's say they are uh, contained between minus one and one, which is the case of interest for us, then uh, the map estimator is actually always beta resilient. And what's important is that the parameter alpha is uh, playing a big role in the quality of the resilience. So when you increase alpha, you reduce the, the, the parameter beta, and therefore you know that the effects are more and more controlled. Um, one possible question is to understand what happens when alpha goes to zero. And uh, we see that in this case, uh, the, the, the resilience is not informative anymore because beta goes to infinity. And actually we also have a result that says that if we use the, uh, let's say it's not MSC, it's MLE, maximum likelihood estimator, uh, not the map, but the maximum likelihood estimator. So this means no prior law, no parameter alpha. Then in this case, uh, actually the estimator is not resilient in the sense that by uh, it's possible for the user to modify a comparison and to have a, a, a like unbounded impact uh, on the on, on theta star. So this is a strong uh, argument towards the use of uh, regularization method or Bayesian uh, priors on theta uh, by understanding that this allows us for a clear control of the, 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 the modifications of the, the, the elementary modifications of the users. Okay, so these are the two results, this monotonicity of the and the resilience that uh, uh, that we could prove on, on this uh, estimation pipeline for the scores. So if I sum up what should yeah. I have a question. Uh, can you say a bit more about um, using the L2 norm in your definition of resilience? Um, have you thought about other norms? Do you think you can get a result for other norms? Because uh, I, I remember when we were looking at the Maystone paper, there was um, 
it sounds like sometimes you might want something stronger, like an infinity norm or. Uh, indeed, so I, I don't know for the infinity norm. Um, so good question. The, the thing, okay, let me think about the proof. I mean, you can always convert, like, you know, there is a generic bound between the L2 and the infinity norm, so you could always convert from one to the other. But I think yeah, uh, so that would be, but you would have a square, root, a square root of the dimension factor, and so that would go to zero as a number of um, items go to infinity. Oh, a number of alternatives go to infinity, which doesn't sound very good. Oh, yeah. the, the, the first answer is indeed that you can convert the norms, uh, and uh, the number of alternatives is not, I mean, it's, of a, I mean, one thing that I can say is that the number of alternatives for a given user is anyway controlled in some sense. Like, like it's it's bounded. It doesn't for I mean for the global community, uh, for the global scores at the end, it can be very big. But uh, remember that these numbers of alternatives is at the end not so big for a given user. Yes. Um, but anyway, I don't know. If you can so, so, so you're saying that in the worst case, the, you could get a resilience for the L infinity norm, and you would have essentially beta divided by square root of the number of alternatives that this user has seen. Indeed, except that I'm, I'm wondering, and this I should check, I, I don't have a direct answer, but it's possible to improve that by looking at really the proof uh, and just changing the norm to see if we can control it. But I don't know if we can improve over this uh, probably poor bound. I see, okay, thanks. But I, yeah, I looked essentially at averages, and, and it was a natural question for me to look at the L2 norm. But I, I will anyway look at it and let you know. So, so maybe just to say, like uh, in the transfer data set right now, like uh, the number of uh, videos can go up to, uh, I don't remember, like at least 5,000 for, for some, some uh, contributors. OK. okay. So yeah, I, I guess uh, it's uh, so small for the the, the best contributors. Uh, it's just like uh, I'm pretty sure this way of bounding the infinity norm with the two norm is pretty good. So it's probably better to really uh, look at the proof and and try to see if we can uh, convey the similar information for LP norms. But my my, my guess that will be that this is possible, yes. But I, I don't know exactly how it behaves with alpha and probably better than what we can uh, expect with this first argument. Um, OK, so uh, again, a summary. We have this situation where we introduced a generalized uh, bad lettering model, uh, which is um, able to transform uh, comparisons into scores based on the, the, the assumption that, uh, first of all, I mean, what we should specify the rule of R given zero. We have seen uh, examples like uh, plus or minus one with the binary and historical broad lettery, uh, the uniform broad lettery with the uniform law. We could, we could imagine the canary uh, broad lettery over uh, several values. For instance, currently it's over 21 values on the platform. I mean, we can interpret it that way. Uh, starting from this low P, uh, we the, 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 essentially, if you want a recipe in some sense to uh, apply this model uh, using your favorite uh, probability law for the comparisons, you end up computing what is phi. Uh, and it appears that in many cases, this, this, uh, fun this function is computable. You choose your uh, parameter alpha for the regularization, and you end up with this optimization problem. And uh, what we have seen is that we have a guarantee of monotonicity among these and resilience as soon as we put a regularization and uh, use bounded comparisons, which is a very reasonable assumption uh, for uh, practical comparison uh, settings. Um, so in some sense, the message is that things are uh, going well and we can, we can continue. Um, one one maybe about like uh, what could be pushed uh, further because uh, essentially uh, this is a recent work which is uh, essentially theoretical but also like um, it's of course interesting to uh, see how the choices that can be made on the generalized bilateral model for instance by uh, choosing the law of uh, the law p which is a, which ha which appears at the very beginning of the model how does this affect the the quality of the construction, the reconstruction of the, the scores, 
for instance, in a situation where uh, we simulate data, where uh, indeed we assume that the, the, the comparisons that are observed indeed come from a generalized probability model with a, an unknown parameter, uh, theta dagger. In that case, uh, we can question what uh, the influence of the estimation of theta star. And in particular, we can uh, be interested to know if we are able to control the distance between the two uh, scores, the true one, the, the ground truth, and the estimated one. Uh, one important aspect is that uh, what will be the effect of adding comparisons? So remember this, this set of uh, compared pairs. And uh, we can imagine that by increasing this uh, value, we will, of course, have a better and better estimation of the scores because we obtain new information about the score itself via uh, a comparison. But like uh, sort of a second order question to uh, realize how this evolves and simulations could help to possibly formulate conjectures. I think they are very natural questions, relatively classical. And for this, I would be curious to discuss with anyone interested. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, it's related, uh, and I already mentioned it, we can really wonder what is the impact of changing p, which has the effect of changing phi. And uh, just to give you an idea, this is the first list of uh, generalized proletary model that uh, we investigated. So I already described the binary, canary. Uh, you see the formulas for phi, which are not so important to look at. Um, I mentioned the uniform one, and maybe the only one that can be looked at is the, um, the family of beta laws, from which the uniform law is actually an example. The uniform law has maybe the, the default of like, essentially you are saying that you're expecting to have very high comparisons, like close to one or minus one, are as probable as like having no preferences or a comparison close to zero. Uh, this is questionable, and uh, it's a real question to know if uh, what can be the effect of changing the law and maybe changing something which is reducing the probability of having provide this core estimation method. We can apply to continuous and discrete comparisons. And that's one of the main contributions is really to have a framework adapted to continuous comparisons. That was also the motivation. Achieving monotonicity and resilience. And so this is one way of uh, proposing the foundations, the theoretical foundations of the BGBT model at the, at like the first step of, of Tornasol and of course, Interesting to see the connection with Mehestan, which can be uh, actually uh, the, the also the, like possible directions of investigations in the future. Like uh, in some sense, what I, I gave is a first overview, but related to what I said in the previous slide, it could be interesting to understand the error that we make with this model or more precisely to quantify the uncertainty on the estimation procedure, because this could have strong influences on the, uh, the connection between uh, generalized broad lettery and may stand for the more global pipeline. And last thing uh, I want to mention about like current works that we are also investigating uh, based on questions from uh, Lee once again, and it's one of the goals of uh, Tournesol for this year, uh, if I understand, it's really that uh, trying to not only uh, consider comparisons to uh, as data from the users, but also like uh, assessments that can take the form of a like or dislike, uh, which will probably allow to have uh, more data of um, like less um, controllable quality, or I don't know how to say that. Um, so just to give an idea of very briefly of what will happen is really the same pipeline, except that you also add this new data of likes and dislikes. And ideally it's uh, one way and the direction is really to combine these two types of data to provide the individual scores. So it's a generalization of the, 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 this, this framework uh, based on the theory for, uh, for uh, non-comparison data in a setting where we also have access to comparison data. So thanks a lot uh, for your attention. I hope that this introduction uh, was clear and I'm of course open to questions.
Great, thanks a lot. Um, if uh, people want more open questions, there are more of them. <laughs> and I think an interesting one is also like uh, uh, the active learning program, like uh, uh, like the we expect like the statistical errors to depend on the graph of comparisons and. Uh, it would be interesting to know what kind of graphs lead to uh, smaller errors. Yeah, completely. And use it uh, a posteriori from this analysis here. And actually about that, maybe one thing I, I decided not to mention, not to talk about it, but the, um, it's possible to design, a, to define a, a Bradley removal based on Gaussian priors, I mean, Gaussian laws. And in this case, this, this uh, graph dependency that you uh, were mentioning there is probably easier to understand theoretically than to track. Uh, so that could be a first direction, but uh, my guess is that yeah, this is a very promising direction. There's a question in the chat. Uh, how to explain it to normies? <laughs> so that they can uh, know how to vote uh, uh, yeah uh, so that uh, their vote is so that they can know that the vote is taken into account uh, <laughs> my answer would be that the mathematical properties are making it uh, normies friendly i don't know in the sense that uh, it's essentially i mean that's just the first properties that we can investigate and as we, there are many others but these ones are saying that okay essentially the thing will behave the way that you expect it to behave. Uh, at least, okay, for the qualitative uh, description. Otherwise, um, I don't know if, I, and that's an open question, but I don't know if it's so necessary to explain how to use this in the sense that it essentially does what you want. And then, uh, I mean, the combination, the fact that users are using it in a way that's personal should be handled by uh, the next part uh, in, in the pipeline, no? Yeah, so, so this is like uh, uh, not an easy uh, implementation thing to do, but one thing that could be nice is like uh, when someone adds a new comparison, you, like, you see like the the scores of the videos that are more, most, um, uh, like the videos that are weighted, uh, that were compared with the videos that are being compared. And, uh, and you see also like, so because I had this uh, whole analogy uh, about, uh, having springs like a, a comparison is like putting a spring between the two uh, videos and uh, uh, like there's a, a, a distance at rest uh, of the spring but if it gets too compressed and it pushes vid video scores away and if it's too uh, too too extended then it like pulls the video the videos apart and you could imagine that when you ins insert a new comparison like you have some dynamic images of how it affects like the, the, the all of the springs like I don't know if I'm being clear but <laughs> I think I follow um, oh. I, one thought I saw I had uh, related to your question uh, um, yeah how to explain is I think there are some wisdom to take from I mean I am a chess player and I have a chess rating and an elo rating and, and uh, I think there is something interesting in this community because it's a place where for decades people have been uh, associated to rankings and so they have a strong uh, feeling of what these rankings mean even if most of the players have absolutely no clue about like and, and never questions themselves probably about like how this is computed. And uh, you, you have some effects that are interesting, and I would be curious to have the impression if this is relevant on the observed tonal scores. For instance, uh, even if you don't understand what's behind, uh, what happens with chess ratings is that if there is a, a given difference of ratings between uh, players, uh, let's say, for instance, 200 points, which is something uh, often occurring, for chess, this means essentially that player A will win maybe a three times out of four it's transformed into uh, this uh, 200 points so it means that implicitly uh, the, the this value this difference of course is really meaningful to the community 
because uh, essentially it appears to be quite robust. This is a good news actually for uh, Tonosol because in some sense the, 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 the matrix of comparisons is also very sparse at chess. <clears throat> Yeah, okay. Um, but the, the reason why I'm mentioning chess also is because um, I would be curious if this is something that we can observe. For instance, if you have a video which is uh, with a score of 20 and you compare it with a video of a score of 40, is it true even for the global score of, of, Mainstein, that, uh, of uh, Thomas Sol that in some sense we have the same effect as between 40 and 60? Like, is it something that could be... Uh, uh, observed uh, in practice. I don't know if, if you know, ever wonder about like what is the effect of adding 20 of a Thomas score, but is it something that could have some kind of invariance observed? So the, the scores are, are squashed to be uh, between one, minus 100 and 100. And actually we've been working on the on the squashing uh, last uh, Tuesday, yeah, so it's quite fresh and not um, there's still there are weird things going on uh, I don't fully understand uh, so a difference of uh, of 20 between 0 and 20 because of this squashing is larger is smaller than the difference of 20 between uh, 70 and, and 90 okay um, so it's really the way that, uh, which is important to to for interpretation also of the, of the quantities uh, so it's not so simple than, than for the chess world. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's it's a it's a question of. Um, I mean, this is a, almost like a, a, a question for users. Like, what do they prefer to have scores between minus one hundred and one hundred? Which, like, uh, or like in, in chess, like eventually you get used to uh, having. Uh, a different scale that is not between minus 100 and 100. Yeah, indeed. So I didn't, this is more a convention, but chess is really simpler than um, than uh, Tournesol because uh, it's really like just this first step, uh, like when you have a single user or, or a single chess world. Um, but for this reason, the, the, change, the, the, the choice of scale has no uh, modification as the one you described. So it's it's really like, um, I mean, it's, the chess world is less complicated than, than Tornesol, I would say. Yeah, so, Julien, uh, the other Julien, GST, GST. <laughs> Is calling for dynamic simulations of, uh, of uh, all of these. <laughs> I, I completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you include in all of these, but yeah, um, yeah. So, so far, we still have trouble making the algorithms really work uh, in a satisfactory manner, but. Uh, yeah, it would be nice also to have these simulations and uh, I guess would give us also insights. Um, so, so what would uh, the, the first question you would like to check on simulations? I mean, okay, the, the, yeah, the many possible things, but for instance, would it be like, I mean, really for the, the choice of the algorithms, like, like the concrete algorithm, like is it really on the, the choice of the, the model itself? Like what, which load do you put? Uh, yeah, actually, that's one issue also we can discuss is, um, uh, so, <laughs> like, right now, uh, it's, well, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I should say it right now, but, like, we, we are about to deploy the, uh, more like the, what you call the uniform Bradley uh, <laughs> uh, theory model, uh, and uh, I think it's fine, like, it's working, uh, it's, like, I have to further test it, and, but you might want to include this beta uh, uh, prior. Right? I don't know how to call it, this function uh, on P of O. Maybe we should give it a name eventually. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you, you have a beta function, what, what I seem to have observed uh, uh, is that um, the scale of the scores 
So, so intuitively, like if you increase beta, then it means like the scores are, are more accurate. The, the comparisons are more accurate. Uh, there are, there, there's less noise. So given a, a, a score difference, you can better predict exactly what is the the, the comparison that will be given. And, and this is very interesting because in practice, you can even assume that um, like when people, for instance, compare videos on all uh, criteria, then you could have a, a higher beta that's uh, associated with the comparison on the main criteria, meaning that they spend more time thinking about the comparison, so you expect less noise. But the issue if you do this uh, straightforwardly, like you, you give a different beta to different comparisons, is that what you infer from this is like uh, comparisons on different scales, like the the scale of the comparison seems to, to depend a lot on the beta. Mm. And so that's unsatisf unsatisfactory. Uh, so this means you cannot really mix different values of beta in uh, on Tomo Um At least not straightforwardly, but so I guess it's still like an yeah. open question. Yeah. Contents, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, agree that it's not the first idea that's what you want. But yeah, it's, it's, this is an interesting question and it's really, uh, yeah, that, that's where simulations could definitely help in conjunction with probably theoretical works to, to understand this better and, and possibly use it uh, to your advantage uh, later on. Yeah. I'm very good with coming up with coming up with more questions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I noticed. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Um. I don't know if you want also to make the Tomsel community vote for the model after explaining what are the effects of choosing one against the other. And that it's really a collaborative in a strong sense. Um, yeah, I mean, the issue is like you, it's better to understand the, <laughs> the math to have an informed uh, uh, vote, especially like, I think there are still like open questions that I don't understand myself. Um, but yeah, like, um, the, the, this relates to the problem of, uh, of uh, liquid democracy. Uh, like if you have people that you trust more or like how do you also like how do you value expertise in this kind of uh, designs um, yeah but that's uh, still another research question <laughs> one thing that I can say that for years uh, you, you were telling me that you have a lot of mathematical questions that we discussed that's a bit the first time that I'm really trying to go into it and so as a mathematician, I'm convinced that about what you said from the beginning, that, that, that yeah, they are interesting. There is room for a lot of things. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that it seems really like uh, to use natural settings that are already existing, but just the, the, the goal itself of the global pipeline is uh, that's, uh, that's also creating new questions that can build on, on produce ones that are better known. For instance, what we did with generalized raw data is, okay, generalization, but the, the basic ideas uh, are really uh, well known. And uh, and then the consequences are quite interesting as well. Yeah, um, and um, like, so, so typically one insight that uh, we, we found uh, while doing this is like, uh, for instance, in, in, in football, uh, uh, like, it's not only about a, 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 a team winning, right? There's a score, a goal difference at the end of the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, like you might want to use this as an information on how to evaluate the, the, the levels of the different teams. Uh, but yeah, but what's interesting is you still want some resilience. You don't want a team to be uh, uh, hacking its, uh, its score. So yeah, th like these questions are, uh, and, and these models are really uh, provide new ways of thinking about these issues and solving them. That's really nice. That's why it could be called like advanced statistics. I mean, I know they do this in basketball for the NBA, like like uh, advanced statistics when you don't take into account just like simple data as, as like scores of the match or even like when it's just victory of the and and, uh, and uh, this is 
extremely used for, for people that are really trying to understand the impact of the player, for instance. So, uh, so this, this, is, this is really going in the sense of adding uh, more subtle uh, information that can be taken into account. So, so actually, the, the, like, w one of the reasons why we started to use, use uh, compressions on Tournosol is because like a few months before starting Tournosol, uh, like we, uh, we had a reading group uh, where we read uh, this uh, PhD thesis by uh, Luca Mestre, who graduated from uh, EPFL with uh, uh, Matthias Grossglauser. And it was really about uh, comparisons. And uh, um, so like he kind of convinced us that there's something more natural about doing comparisons and more like uh, valuable, uh, like informative. And, and also like because you have very repeated uh, comparisons, you can also reduce noise uh, using uh, multiple mm -hmm. data. And, uh, and interestingly, the last chapter of this thesis is about uh, applications uh, of similar kind of models to football. And one model they, they have is, uh, um, like they use a, a kernel method to try to evaluate the influence of, uh, of each player. Like, you, like essentially a football team is like uh, represented as uh, the vector of the, the players. Uh, each player has uh, some influence, and and, um, and they and they train their model by looking at which players play which game, uh, and, and which led to which scores, and uh, this uh, led them to evaluate uh, the the like the, the impact of each player and also to make predictions uh, that depend on the which teams or which are the players of the teams that are going to play. Okay, so really. Easy. So this is inside the, the, the thesis you mentioned? Yeah. Uh, I would be curious to have this if the link is available to all the people. Realizing that I'm streaming what I'm doing, I don't like it. Yeah, there is a question, how do the optimal voting strategy differ from the honest one in corner cases? Uh, I guess it's more for you, Lee. Uh, I, I mean, one last thing also as well with your models is for like, like the monotonicity means that um, like in the context of sports, like teams are always incentivized to win as yeah. by as much as a margin as possible. So that's one good property. <laughs> as soon as they optimize their score, yeah, yeah. <laughs> true. And um, yeah, this is important. It's, it's interesting to look at uh, the impact of having, uh, like for instance, this ELO rating, which is also based on, on validity on the community of chess compared with other sports where essentially players are optimizing something else. Uh, and this, uh, yeah, the fact that the, 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 the scoring method favors these kind of things is, of course, a strong point. For instance, it's interesting when you look at the ELO ratings in tennis, uh, you're not surprised that with first or with among the first ones, that it, it can be significantly diff diff different from the, the, the rankings, the official ones from the tennis federation, because it's, uh, it's really based on a different idea. And for instance, in tennis, you have no incentive to I mean, a victory is a victory uh, in a tournament. You don't care about if the guy was like 100 in the ranking of first. While with the rating, it's sensitive to that. So it's also an example where, I mean, why this is really able to incorporate more subtle information that just should be the, yeah. uh, I, I win and I don't even look at against who. And of course, going to continuous comparisons is, is much, uh, it's much step further, of course, but it's, uh, I am I'm pretty, I mean, one thing that I am pretty confident in is the fact that based on the usage of error rating, as I said before, it's like, it seems to be uh, quite robust in my, my, my own feeling, at least for the individual scores, this, even with like a uh, few hundreds of comparisons, you can really have something that, that's possibly robust. And maybe it's an interesting direction also to look at what has been done, a lot more like with the Bradley Theory community. And then to try to generalize is also a source of possible uh, progress for Thomas, I guess. But okay, this I would be more curious to discuss with people that are more aware of the literature than me. But 
I, I find the situation in sports uh, quite promising. I like the thesis that starts with humans are comparison machines. One question for uh, Luca Mestre is like uh, when I look at the, the contents, possibly, he, 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 I guess he knows very well the methods of, uh, uh, I mean, this, this kind of relatory or I see that he's citing other things that are uh, unknown. Maybe it could be interesting to ask him if he is aware of anything that's close to what we developed. Yeah. Uh, I think now he, he works at. Uh... Uh, start check he works for Spotify and yeah still and uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions like this for at Spotify. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll send him an email. Um. I hope you liked your your recent video. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, and so what's nice as well from an implementation point of view is that uh, uh, all you need to specify is like uh, the five function. Yeah. So that's really easy to do. So contribution uh, to the code are Sorry? As it's very easy to adapt as far as the term compared to the, to the first implementation of the, yeah. of the uh, continuous web based area, as we called it. Uh, if you want to experiment, it should be yeah, more and more accessible to, to, to directly implement uh, the algorithm and on GitHub uh, in the repository of uh, the library we are building. Yeah, actually, it's exactly what happened in the theory side. It's like uh, I started with the started with this first continuous domain model, and then realizing that okay, actually there is the general principle that makes it like working the same way for everyone, um, and so for free in some sense, <laughs> like uh, all the consequences are transferred, uh, and it has the same impact on the algorithmic side. So that also makes the comparisons between five functions easy and so on so it's, it's um once you have one you you will so have all the others one thing also that i can say is, is that it's not a surprise that the five functions are always relatively easily computable because it's really like uh, this so-called moment generating functions uh, or 
cumulant functions when you take the log. And uh, at the end, uh, it's just, uh, I did a few computations myself and then I realized it's, it's enough to open tables from books where they are essentially providing these modern generating functions. And then you can just copy paste and <laughs> it's like the work that has been done by uh, other people from decades. So, I mean, sometimes this shows something that I would like to push a bit, but like there is a strong connection with many fields that are also seeing this structured mathematical structure with the phi function uh, appearing. It's, it's relatively, I mean, I, I found di different fields already. So that it's also interesting to see if we can connect, but in some sense, the, it's also saying that it's built on nice ideas that are, uh, that have been proven to be uh, fruitful in many contexts, like, which I guess is a, another good point. What's the plan with the paper now? <laughs> I, I received a message from my uh, co-author uh, telling me that he put some introduction in the paper. So I, I checked at it and that was nice. But yeah, okay, we, I guess we will iterate a bit. One thing that I would like to do is to push more on, uh, I mean, literature side to, to have something where, I mean, just to connect with different communities uh, more uh, nicely. For instance, you know, some results can be seen as very classical from some perspective. So I guess this could be useful to investigate like that. Like we don't, we, we show that we, we, I mean, it can give ideas first and, and second, it can help connecting with I mean, interesting people with that and with Thomas more generally, of course. But then it's, it's not easy between writing and thinking about another of your questions. <laughs> okay. Thank you.